close this subject. I don't want anybody to move. Because I want to bring this subject right down to today. Now you think this is a very spiritual subject. But what I really wanted to get to was in the last 20 years, Islam has been in the news almost every day. It's Muslims this or Muslims this, Hezbollah this, Jihad that. Terms that most of you don't know anything about. Mujahideen. Well, what is all of this for? With the fall of the Iron Curtain, an era in global politics came to an end as the Western world could no longer define itself in opposition to communism. During the past few years, we have witnessed a return to a previous pattern in which the West seeks its reason for being by placing itself now in opposition to Islam. As it did during the Cold War, the United States portrays itself as the defender of liberty against totalitarian barbarism, but the symbols of evil are no longer taken from the evil empire, which they said was Russia, but the symbols of evil are now taken from the Muslim world. So you have Saddam Hussein and Muammar al-Qaddafi portrayed as megalomaniac gangsters, worthy of some Ian Fleming novel. And they are made to represent Islam in the dichotomy of them versus us. Now, what I'm saying is a part of an introduction to a book written about Louis Farrakhan by an Islamic scholar from Sweden. Years ago, when we used to come to the temple, it would scare us because we would come in the temple and see a blackboard. And on the right, looking out, or the left, Looking in, you saw the American flag on the left and the flag of Islam on the right. And in the middle were these words, which one will survive the war of Armageddon? On the side where there was uh, the American flag, it said Christianity with a cross slavery, suffering, and death with a black man hanging on a tree. Under Islam, it had freedom, justice, and equality. Now, when you walk in the temple and saw that blackboard, whoa, these people are anti-American. But what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was showing us was that the final battle for hegemony or control would be between two forces in the world, Islam and the West represented by America. I want you to hear me now. As was the case during the Cold War, this dichotomy is reflected in popular culture by the movie industry. So in productions such as Not Without My Daughter and True Lies, Muslims replace communists as the scary aliens, the subhuman, merciless incarnations of evil bent on destroying what is good and decent. This is why most of you are afraid of Muslims and Islam and think this is some strange religion from some god in space or somewhere else. Now Hollywood has weighed in in the cultural war. Listen now. Defenders 
of the valuable way of life are justified in exterminating this robot-like enemy who is beyond reason and human emotions. So the link between Arnold Schwarzenegger, which means black nigga, I believe, Well, that's what it means. Schwarzenegger. Black nigger. So the link between Arnold Black nigger, Arab Hunt, <laughs> the link between Schwarzenegger's Arab Hunt and True Lies and the onslaught on Arab civilians in Operation Desert Storm is obvious. The victims were mere stereotypes, impossible to identify with. CNN blurred the distinction between drama and reality in a war enacted as a live action spectacle in our living room. The reason for returning to the opposition between the West and Islam is due not only to tradition, but to the global ambition of America in the West and Islam in the East. When President Bush proclaimed victory for the New World Order, he was offering a predated vision of global hegemony for the American model of society. Before Nixon died, Nixon said, the enemy of American democracy is not communism, it is fundamentalist Islam. So now the stage has been set for a war against Islam. Listen, a scholar by the name of Akbar Ahmed suggests that instead of the clumsy global classifications of first, second, third world, north, south, east, west, the world map of the 1990s can be divided into two major categories. Civilizations that are exploding, reaching out, expanding, bubbling with scientific ideas, economic plans, political ambitions, cultural expressions, and those that are imploding, collapsing on themselves with economic, political, and social crises, which prevent any serious attempts at major initiatives. Though perhaps this is overly simplified, Ahmed's perspective is still illuminative for an understanding of the global trends of the 1990s. The imploding nations are like the Republic of Korea, this is what he writes, pose no serious threat to the exploding civilizations, but in the present process of shaping a world culture or a global civilization, the American impact is set forth with a self-confident arrogance. The term American is not used here as a national or geographical, but a cultural concept as its exploding character already transcends nationality and geography. So this writer chooses the term American because the United States is taking the lead in and English is the lingua franca of a civilization that includes other nations and linguistic groups in the West, East, North, and South. So America has become the symbol of that which opposes Islam. I'm almost there. Give me a little bit, please. This exploding civilization with global ambition is characterized by consumerism, and its cultural impact is felt everywhere we find McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pizza Hut, CNN, Madonna, MTV, Mickey Mouse, Levi's, and Dallas, and other cultural symbols. America's cultural dominance has a sacred pilgrimage place, Mr. Ahmed notes. As the Vatican is for Catholics, as Mecca is for the Muslims, as Amritsar is for the Sikhs, Disneyland is for the Americans. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Unlike Mecca, the Vatican, or Amritsar, Disneyland can be duplicated. There are now two in the United States, one in France and one in Japan, which reveals this civilization's ability to transcend ethnicity and geography as non-white societies like Japan can align themselves with America through one of this civilization's most powerful bodies, the G7. So beneath the surface of this glimmering consumerism is a belief in liberal democracy, capitalist economy, and secular politics. At its best, it promotes freedom of speech, intellectual pursuits, scientific endeavors, emancipation of women, and individual liberties. Had the self-presented saga of American civilization been the true story, and its advantages been as promised exclusively intended, its project might have realized the success so arrogantly asserted. But concealed behind ideological ideal images is the backyard of global poverty, racism, sexism, classism, and totalitarian denial of the people's right to self-determination. So the gulf separating professed ideals and experienced reality provides fertile soil for alternative ideologies. Islam is the most rapidly expanding religion in the world and is presently the only other exploding civilization with global ambition. But Islam checks unrestrained materialism with spirituality and points to the aforementioned backyard conditions as evidence of the failure of man's self-sufficiency. If this does not work, Islam says, why not try the way of God? Far from a proposal based on a rejection of man's capabilities, Islam believes in man's ability as God's vicegerent to establish a benign society. Islam, the guarantor against poverty, racism, classism, and sexual degradation of women, as complete a vision of civilization as, as the American Islam provides an alternative model of democracy, economy, and politics, thereby formulating a true challenge to Bush's new world order. Now, the reason I cite that is because the attack now is on Islam. Today, you heard from Sani Abacha a Nigerian head of state who is a Muslim. Today you heard from Muammar Gaddafi, a head of state who is a Muslim. But Libya is under sanctions. Iraq is under sanctions. Iran is under sanctions. All of these are Muslims. Sudan is under sanctions. Or they're trying to embargo. Why are you attacking Muslims? You say, well, they're fundamentalists, they're terrorists. Well, brothers and sisters, we are Muslims. All of you by nature are born to submit your will to do the will of God. Whether you call yourself a Christian or a Hebrew or a nationalist or pan-Africanist, at the core of your being, you are created to obey the originator of the heavens and the earth. And everything that you seek, you can find those principles that you stand on embodied in the universe of his creation. Now listen, the nation of Islam has always been a thorn in the side of the rulers of this world. Now they are angry with Elijah Muhammad because, meaning no disrespect, he said white people were devils. Now what did he mean? See, if deceptive intelligence rationalizes disobedience to God, and that is in every human being. God had to make 
and give form and expression to that deceptive intelligence in a human being, then give that human being power and dominion to deceive the earth and to practice deceptive intelligence. Now look, I'm sorry, I gotta tell it or God will kill me if I don't tell it.